Podrick was diagnosed with ankylosing spondylitis in, uh, at the age of 17. And um, I suppose ankylosing spondylitis is being replaced by the term axial spondyloarthritis. So the two terms are, I suppose, broadly interchangeable. Um, ankylosing spondylitis is one of the spondyloarthropodes. Um, and these are a group of conditions that are characterized by uh, chronic inflammation, uh, particularly affecting the, the, site, the insertional site of either tendons or ligaments to bone, the entities. And in a, uh, a rheumat an adult rheumatology service, I suppose the, the conditions we would see the most of are ankylosing spondylitis as well as sciatic arthritis, and to a lesser extent, um, arthritis associated with inflammatory bowel disease and also uh, reactive arthritis. So, uh, Baudrick's initial presentation uh, when he was 17 was quite typical for ankylosing spondylitis. Um, he had a lot of pain and stiffness in his lower back. Um, and in ankylosing spondylitis, this uh, can often be so severe to awake the person from sleep, particularly in the second half of the night. Um, it can start you know, on one side or another, but generally progresses to affect both sides. Um, stiffness is a, you know, a very important feature of uh, the condition and the stiffness really lasts uh, you know at least 30 minutes if it's stiffness lasting a minute or two that's probably not as a result of, of ankylosing spondylitis um, and another characteristic feature is that it it does tend to improve with exercise uh, initially it was thought that the the male to female ratio for the condition was about nine or ten to one males to females but more common or more recent uh, research has shown that that ratio is, is much lower than that and it's probably in the order of about two to one. So this, you know, probably has resulted in the condition being underdiagnosed in female patients. Um, so while uh, ankylosing spondylitis is primarily a disease that affects the spine, it, it is really important to note that it's it's a systemic inflammatory disease, and it does affect uh, multiple body sites or other body sites. Um, commonly, it can affect either uh, the peripheral joints or peripheral, um, as I say, areas of insertion of either ligaments or tendons to the bone, the entheses. Um, and the Achilles tendon is a, is a common site for this to affect. Um, it can also affect uh, the eye and uh, uveitis, which Podrick had developed at some point during his, his condition, um, is quite common in, in up to 25 or 30 percent of patients. Um, uh, cardiovascular disease is another important thing to consider and classically we're taught about things like aortitis which is inflammation to the, the root of the aorta or, or valvular disease but uh, so more, more commonly um, we should be thinking about things like ischemic heart disease which is, is very uh, common in patients who have had you know ankylosing spondylitis for a long period of time um, and this probably reflects the ongoing inflammation in, you know, in these patients. Um, and then last year at the bottom, I've just mentioned osteoporosis, and that's being increasingly recognized as being important in ankylosing spondylitis. So I say, uh, Pordrick was diagnosed with the condition at 17 years of age. Um, he tested positive for the HLA-B27 gene, and 90% you know, of patients, certainly in Ireland, 90% of patients with ankylosing spondylitis uh, are positive for the HLA B27 gene, and it's really so prevalent that you know if you have a patient who is negative for that gene test, then you really ought to think twice. You know, do you have the correct diagnosis? Particularly if the patient's symptoms are a little bit atypical. Um, so over the first six years uh, of his treatment, Podrick was was treated with a number of both synthetic uh, DMARDs and also biologic DMARDs, three different uh, uh, TNF inhibitors. Um, and certainly infliximab, which is listed last there, did seem to work for a period of time, but uh, after probably about two years became secondarily ineffective. Um, I know Deirdre had mentioned that for her, uh, Humira was a miracle drug, but in, in Podrick's case, as we spoke about yesterday, it didn't really seem to make any impact at all. So quite a different response, you know, between different patients. And um, so by 2010, 
Uh, and at that stage, Podrick has been, had been on infliximab for uh, about two years. Um, his disease was really flaring again. Um, he had large effusions in both his knees and elbows. Um, he also had significant stiffness in his hips and his ankles, and his, ra his inflammatory markers were very raised. Uh, in 2010, he also developed uh, anterior uveitis, and this unfortunately was uh, very treatment resistant as well, despite you know very high dose of steroids, 20, 30, even 40 milligrams of prednisolone per day. So in 2010, his infliximab was switched to another TNF inhibitor, uh, Symponi or Golimimab, and similar, similarly to his infliximab, this did initially lead to uh, an improvement in his condition, but again, over a period of probably about two years, uh, it became ineffective. And in 2012, um, he was switched to Simsia, which is uh, the fifth uh, DNF inhibitor that we have. Um, he was admitted to Harold's Cross in October of 2014. Uh, this was with increasing pain, uh, morning stiffness and fatigue, and his Simsia dose was doubled to 400 milligrams every two weeks. Um, but unfortunately, this didn't have any impact on his disease. And in February of 2015, it was noted that his, his CRP, and that's a blood test, that's a, a measure of inflammation, was over 100, which is e extremely high for someone with a, you know, a, a chronic condition. And he also had uh, very large elbow and knee effusions. And uh, things had gotten so bad but that by April of 2015, he presented to the accident and emergency, emergency department with increased pain. Um, and at that stage, he was noted to be uh, very anemic with a hemoglobin of 10.8. The normal range would, the lower end of the normal range would be 13.5. Um, his albumin was very low and his CRP remained above 100, which really is a reflection of how, you know, how unwell Podrick was at that point. He was noted to have developed uh, fixed flexion contractures in his elbows, and a DEXA scan that was done around that time showed that he had developed osteoporosis. Um, so at that stage, his Simsia was switched to uh, uh, another biologic agent, a Batacept, which isn't a TNF inhibitor and works uh, by another mode of action. It works by um, inhibiting T cells, your T lymphocytes. So uh, we talked about uh, rituximab, which acts by inhibiting the B lymphocytes. So Batacept works on a slightly different mechani mechanism of action to that. Um, and then by January of 2016, I say his, his weight had, had dropped. Um, probably again reflecting the ongoing in level of inflammation in the system and Podrick had had to stop working due to uh, you know this is quite high disease activity then in April of 2016 uh, he was seen by the hematology service for his anemia and they felt that it was uh, secondary to his active uh, ankylosing spondylitis and he was commenced on uh, neorecormin, which is a synthetic uh, form of EPO, or erythropoietin. Um, he, his abatacept was stopped, and he was switched to uh, secukinumab, which is one of the other, one of the newer biologic uh, medicines we have, um, and it acts by uh, inhibiting the IL-17 pathway, so another inflammatory pathway. And you can see that uh, I've done a little table there to show his CRP, and again, that's a measure of inflammation within his system, and it really had a quite a you know dramatic and an immediate effect, certainly on terms of the CRP. So in March of 2016, his CRP was 124, <coughs> and by May, uh, that would be you know four weeks after he'd started on the second kinemab, uh, it had dropped down to three, and it's really remained within the normal range ever since then. Uh, he was seen back by the haematology service in 2016 and at that stage his haemoglobin had come up to, to the normal range and this is probably a reflection of one, the, uh, his response to neorecormin but also to the fact that uh, his inflammation was much better controlled and allowed his haemoglobin to come up. Uh, so by November of last year uh, Podrick was doing quite a bit better. I, th I th think that it's fair to say that the the, respond, or the, the improvement he felt wasn't quite as quick as the, you know, the, the huge drop in the CRP, but nevertheless it was uh, 
a very marked improvement and his BASDI score which uh, is a, I guess a subjective measure of, of disease activity that had improved significantly from April and then again he was, he was reviewed just a couple of months ago and he was uh, reported feeling better again um, his CRP remains in the normal range and his weight has come up to to just under 60 kilograms so Podrick I think himself feels that things are going much better than now than they have been for quite a while. So in summary uh, Podrick he's diagnosed as say at 17 years of age with eye-closing spondylitis. Uh, his, his condition has affected many uh, systems within the body. Um, his you know case of uh, eye-closing spondylitis has proven very difficult to treat but I think hopefully now with secukinumab um, it does appear to be working well and that's something we're, we're, we're finding uh, with some of the newer biologic agents that um, different um, and this was mentioned earlier I think as well in terms of medications different uh, medications that work on specific inflammatory pathways um, they there's quite a, a divergent response between patients and even um, within individual patients themselves that have two different body sites affected. For example, someone with psoriasis who's put on secukinumab might have a, a great response in terms of their psoriasis, but if they have a, you know, arthritis that affects their feet or their hands, may not necessarily um, respond well to that. Is that okay? So I hope I've given a pretty accurate picture of the medical care you've got, Podrick. Is that right? So I think at this stage, Louise and Podrick are going to come up to the the seats here and they're going to have a chat and I think open um, open it to the floor for questions. Okay, so I just wanted to focus with you what it was like age 17 to be diagnosed with. That age, you think it's not something that all people get. You know, mm -hmm. it's not something that you, you'd expect to come across yourself at that age. You know, it's something that your, your grandparents might have, kind of a thing. Um, and I think it's kind of a definitely a huge, it's just a huge shock to the system. But at least you know what's been causing the pain and what the issue is. You can put a label on it or put a name onto it. Um, what were your symptoms before you were diagnosed? Easily, I say a year. Like you know, it's kind of it's kind of put down to growing pains at that age, mm -hmm. or it's like simple sort of stuff. You say, oh, you know, you're just looking for a day off school or whatever it might be, kind of thing. But you kind of know in the back of your mind that mm -hmm. you know, thought there's something seriously wrong here. Like you know, and when you have the kind of blood work that backs it up, I guess to say like there's something, something's not right here, kind of thing. You have to, you have to get looked at, get it sorted, kind of. You have to kind of. Quite your corner, I guess, if you plan taking you seriously, you have to kind of say because that. of your age, was it? Yeah, Did you feel it was because you were too young to have arthritis? I think that would have been the yeah. perception at the time, definitely, from people just not being aware of that it can affect young people as such at that age, unless they've seen it themselves. They're not going to know what it's going to think they're. What about the school? How did, how did that play out in school? And they were reasonable enough, like you know, they made accommodations where they just like a bit of a day off or also they needed to be home or at least say it was just like kind of falling asleep in the class from exhaustion or whatever it is, no problem saying it, but like you know, whatever it might be. They were very good in that regard, like they were made aware of the situation, which I think helps um, if you're going through something like that. To have people aware you're trying to hide it and keep it away from people and say, oh, I don't know, it's not safe. That's something they need to know about. Like, there are certain cases where people don't need to know, but I think the people that are um, in your life on a day to day basis, they need to know that you have an issue and you need to uh, look after mm -hmm. as best you can. Mm -hmm. And what about so when you're 17 and your friends are heading out or heading off to college or playing sports or doing whatever? 17, I can't remember that. 17 years ago, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, were you able to partake in that, or did you feel that you were, you know, um, distant? I had like a, a similar experience to, uh, what was it, a lot there, was it, yeah. 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 that's your, you tend to say, oh, no, there's nothing wrong with me, I'm going to mm -hmm. push myself and keep going, and I'm going to keep up with the lads, whatever yeah. it is, I would have mentioned that for a couple of years easily. And just kind of pushing yourself and knowing that you're kind of doing the wrong thing uh, in a way in the back of your mind it's actually kind of saying i shouldn't be out here doing this i should be kind of at home resting sort of thing you know you don't um, 
but you don't have that realization at the time. You know, like it's only afterwards that you have that realization where you kind of accept it and you say, mm. you know, I probably shouldn't have pushed myself that much, or I shouldn't have been working that hard, or I shouldn't be doing this kind of kind of stuff like that. But that's only after the fact. My point so it's, it's, it's a great thing, but it would have been kind of affected me in a way that I wouldn't have been able to get out to events. Say, I just would have been too exhausted or too tired, too tired to. Mm. To function even, you know, it would have been kind of I could get to college, I could, I could study, get through for half a day's sort of stuff, and then I'll just wipe out then for the rest of the rest of the day. I mean, it would have to get me at least 12 hours resting and kind of tossing and turning, trying to get asleep, and kind of uh, just to keep myself right for getting what I needed to get done to get that sort of stuff done. That would have been the, the main issues, but it definitely would have been affected by social social life and different things like that throughout the throughout the years. It still does to this day even like you have to kind of plan things out and manage things as best as can. And I kind of showed us how you know the, the different medications that you acquired and you know the certain medication the medication. So what was that like to go through, you know, being turn up in the clinic and you know the switch to new medication you know, it was that you were frustrated with that, or did you find, oh, here we go again? Just are they ever going to find something that's going to work for me? Or how how did you keep yourself well, you know, and optimistic during that? Because you did go through a lot of medications, a lot of switches. Yeah, no, well, you know, like an optimistic person in general, like you kind of have to be with a, with a condition like this. There's no, no sense being negative about it. You're not going to end up in a good place, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, I would have found like certain medications gave relief, but they weren't the cure, like they were just temporary fixes to get you through the day, like the painkillers or the steroids, the anti-inflammatories kind of thing, like they were good as a, a stopgap sort of a thing, but they weren't really the, the cure, as you say, but there's no cure, essentially, it's more, more just management, you know, I find the percentics are very good for kind of keeping things at bay, but I find the, I find diet more and has made more of a positive impact okay. than anything else for myself. Like going uh, gluten free, dairy free, and sugar free, kind of putting out all the toxic stuff in, in the diet gives your body a chance to kind uh, of recover and kind of repair itself. You know, it doesn't have to deal with the toxic load going in all the time from the even some of the medications like that are you know, horrendous side effects that I found. There's the uh, metatrexate and a few of the other ones as well that they're just they're not worth taking, you know, because they're just they're not they're the side effects is maybe worse than the pain and the inflation itself. You know, and put up with that and put up with the nausea kind of thing you would. Mm -hmm. But um, definitely, you know, I've been through the middle of the drugs, and uh, mm. they'd say... Do you ever feel like going, oh, to have it, it's not, you know, it's going to work? Uh, well, you know, when you're in pain, you'll, do, you'll take anything, really, like, that's the truth, like, you will, like, you'll try all sorts of stuff to, to get rid of the pain, like, and even if it is a temporary relief, really, you, will, you will try it to see if this might, this might be the one that helps, this might be the one that will be some lasting relief, you definitely will try it, just to, just to see. Even if you're aware of side effects, you kind of say, well, I'll have a chance to see how it goes, but it's um, not, the, not the best way to go about things, but you know, you have to, you don't know it until you know it, and that's what you've been through, essentially. Thanks everyone. Um, for anyone who doesn't know me, I'm Emer Sheridan, one of the senior occupational therapists in the rheumatology department here, alongside with Jane, who spoke earlier. Um, I'm just going to run through Porex occupational therapy intervention since 2014. Um, so I suppose, as Jane would have discussed earlier, um, the OT focus, I suppose, really w with any patients, but in particular with our rheumatology patients, is looking at enhancing independence and quality of life. And with PORIC, this is really achieved on each admission through focusing on assessment and goal setting, um, self-management education, a review of PORIC's ability to complete his ADLs, and obviously the one I'd speak a little bit more in depth about is vocational rehabilitation. And all of this really was with the overall aim of returning PORIC to his valued activities and roles that were identified by him on each admission. Um, Okay, so I suppose just to expand that a little bit further, when we're looking at the OT intervention, and I know Jane probably <coughs> touched on some of this earlier, the key areas we looked at with Porik were around his self-management education, and Porik is really a good self-manager and made our job very easy across the years in terms of his ability to, to implement a lot of the education and the strategies that we were um, discussing with him. So a lot of the things we would have looked at were areas, I suppose, around managing fatigue, which Porik had identified as a huge issue um, across the years and on each admission that we saw him. 
We also looked at education regarding joint protection techniques, particularly in relation to Porrick's job. And we looked at strategies around improving um, sleep hygiene and stress management as well, because obviously with a chronic condition, as Porrick had outlined, there's a huge um, challenge to our valued roles and activities. So stress was obviously a, a part of this as well. So we looked at very practical strategies that Porrick could implement to help manage stress throughout each of the admissions. I suppose other areas we looked at as well was psychosocial support and Gillian, our social worker, will speak a little bit more about that in terms of, again, managing a chronic condition. Um, and one of the areas, again, we looked at was um, improving Park's recreational uptake and balance. And that's really looking at how a person um, can look at alternatives um, to their recreational pursuits. But this has to be, again, in line with their abilities and values along the way as well. And again, very practical things that we looked at with Porrick included pressure relief, particularly around um, skin issues. And we also looked at his ability to complete his ADLs, particularly in 2015, as Connor outlined when he was very systemically unwell. So very practical day-to-day -day functional pieces around that. Okay, so I suppose just to really expand, and I know Yvonne would have spoken at length about this this morning, but really the, the big role and the key role I suppose OT took with Porrick throughout his admissions was <coughs> vocational uh, rehabilitation and vocational assessment. So I suppose we do know that re-engaging with suitable work and education has a massive impact on physical and psychological <coughs> well-being. And I suppose Porrick had identified, I suppose, some difficulties with his role in 2015 when he was very systemically unwell, working with Britt Garland. Um, I suppose some of the things we looked at were really the assessment process around getting Porrick back to work um, and we looked at activity analysis and that really involves us breaking down the component parts of Porrick's job and looking at how you know we can enable Porrick to return to work which was the key goal identified by him. We also use standardised assessments in this, such as the AS worker instability scale as well. And of course, a semi-structured interview, which really gets to the, the bones of what Porrick's role really entails and how we can get him back to work and re-engaging in work, which was his big goal at the time. So as Connor was saying in April 2015, Porrick was very systemically unwell. And it was at this time, I suppose, that we had a request from Porrick's occupational physician in his work um, really looking for some input from OT and from Professor Fitzgerald as well around an assessment of Porrick's current status and the prognosis to get him back to his role with Brit Fick Ireland. So this is where OT really jumped in and had a key role in all of that. Um, so as Yvonne probably would have mentioned earlier, what the a couple of things we looked at with Porrick um, in relation to trying to get him back to his role we're obviously a phased and graded return to work and this is key for someone who's been out of work for a period of time that we take a very phased slow approach to getting the person back to work rather than getting them back full time and risking them falling out of work again. We also looked at what's termed reasonable accommodation and what that really means is that just that the job is no harder for Porrick to do than it would be for anyone else who doesn't have an MSK condition. We wrote a list of recommendations to Porrick's employer and, like I said, that included a phased and graded return to work, reasonable accommodations. We also requested an ergonomic assessment of Porrick's workplace and we looked at the opportunity for Porrick to be able to delegate tasks where necessary. Now, a good employer will take this on board, but sometimes we have to fight a little bit harder and liaise a little bit harder. Um, to do this, but these would be some of the key things that OT would always look to for um, getting a person back to work. So I suppose thankfully Park did go back to work at one stage, but I suppose in 2016 decided to just take a little bit of time out to look at alternative options. And I saw Porrick as an outpatient in October in 2017. And thankfully, as Connor said, he was doing so much better at that stage than, than previously. Um, so Porrick is now in the stage of where he's thinking about setting up his own business and it was referred to us by the CNS just to, to link in with him around that. So we really, I suppose, discussed some options around returning to work in a, in a graded way. We looked at some problem solving around, again, revising the self-management education. And at that stage, um, I discussed with Porrick around the link with external agencies such as citizens information, particularly in relation to allowances and um, supports that may be financially available to him for setting up his own business. So I suppose really the key role of Porrick over the years has been um, reviewing his um, goals and, and what he wants to do, looking at his valued activities 
and and really trying to get him back uh, engaging in work that that is meaningful and sustainable to him like i say ot my job with Parik is very easy because he's a very good self-manager and has good insight really into into self-management strategies but thankfully at, at this phase we're hopefully moving towards a, a graded return to work um, and very positive work in, in the future is that okay? Is that okay, Park? <laughs> okay. So I'm going to hand you over to Karen Flynn, who's our senior occupational therapist here. Physiotherapist. Slash <laughs> occupational therapist. Yeah, two for the price of one. Hello, everyone. Um, what I'm going to talk today is about the physiotherapy assessment and management of a patient with AS and focusing on Porig's last admission to us here in the rheumatology unit. So as we've heard, and that's actually a typo, it's 13 years diagnosis of AS. He comes in yearly to the rheumatology unit for rehab and disease management and his last admission was in February. At that time what he was complaining of was ongoing neck and low back pain and stiffness and to a lesser extent T-spine pain. So predominantly it was lumbar spine that was symptomatic um, and to a lesser extent neck and T-spine. Left more than right hip was quite symptomatic at the time as was his knees and all of these symptoms had been for years um, aggravated by standing, walking, bending over, sustained uh, position and eased with movement, stretching, rest and exercise and activity. And for Por Pordrick it was a balance between trying to do enough activity that would alleviate his symptoms but not doing too much to aggravate and particularly with regards to his hip pain. Um, his, all his pain rating was about 4 to 7 out of 10. His EMS was lasting about 2 hours at the time and his fatigue was 4 to 5 out of 10. His mood at the time, despite all his symptoms and all he'd been through, was reportedly good. He had noticed some improvement in his joint symptoms on Cosentex, but none in his eye symptoms at that time. And at that stage, he'd been off his Cosentex for about three months at that time because of the eye surgery, isn't that correct? Yeah. Um, so physical activity, part of our subjective assessment would always involve uh, questioning about how active patients are and what kind of physical activity they're partaking. Because as we all know, according to the stats, only 30% <coughs> of the Irish population are achieving the um, physical activity guidelines as laid down by the WHO. So that's something we'd always try and address and promote and find it's a matter of, again, of finding an activity that a patient can do, especially if they're sore or tired, um, that they can tolerate comfortably. So that could be pool-based exercise as opposed to land-based if that is an issue. Um, but having said that, he was trying to maintain a certain amount of physical activity. He was swimming twice a week. He was walking about half an hour once a week. He didn't have a bike at home, but he was using his pedals. Have you got a bike since, Borg? Yep, excellent. Um, his weight was stable, and it was increasing slowly. It had gone up 4.6 kg at that time, which was great. I think it was 40 or 57 kilos, and you said it was 59 now, so that's great. It's going up in the right direction. At that time, it was still low at 18.6, but it was getting better. So we've gone through all that. I won't waste time going through that. Just interestingly enough, in his hobbies, beekeeping, very interesting hobby, so and swimming and walking. So all of those are, would involve sustained, well, particularly the beekeeping, he'd need good stamina and endurance to be able to keep up with those and to be able to partake in them for as, as long as he would like to. Um, so then the examination then, so a full peripheral and spinal uh, assessment is carried out with each patient with AS. And we use the bath outcome measures. Has anyone heard of those? I'm sure the people here have, but anyone else? Any physios in the audience? Yeah? Okay. Have you heard of the bath outcome measures? Yeah. Okay. So for anyone that doesn't know, they're basically a set of outcome measures that were developed in bath, hence the name in the UK, in the 90s. And um, they're used to track and monitor the course of a uh, patient's condition. So they consist of the BASME, the Bath Ankylosing Spondylitis Metrology Index, the uh, BASV, Functional Index, and bas Diet Disease Activity Index. So the measures for the, the BASME is um, tragus to wall. So as you can see from Pordrick, he's, he's quite a good upright posture, so he's not really in any way flex forward. It's basically the <coughs> patient's ability to, to uh, correct back to neutral when measured against a wall. So his was good at, on, I've just put it on admission and discharge there. So you can see 9.5, I mean, that's pretty normal. His lumbar spine flexion measuring using the Schober's test was 7 centimeters. Again, that's pretty good for lumbar spine flexion. No change in, on discharge because it was, you know, it was probably as good as it was going to be. 
Um, lumbar spine flexion again pretty good, improved on discharge. C spine rotation again pretty good, but up 10 degrees on discharge. Intermalleolar distance would be the one thing that would have brought down his BASME score. Um, 50 centimeters at the time, no improvement on, on discharge because of his hip limitation. So basically how to calculate the BASME score then, all those measures are referenced against a table and you calculate a score out of 10. The higher the score out of 10, the more significant the degree of um, restriction movement wise. So you can see there on admission he was 2 and it improved to 1.6 on discharge, which again is in the milder end of the scale, so it's not bad really at all. Um, the bas fee and bas dire they're both subjective questionnaires. The bas fee is a 10-point questionnaire. It's a 10-centimeter VAS line, and it measures the patient's ability, you know, how easy or how hard it is to do certain daily activities. So 4.5 he scored on admission, and that improved to 3.3 on discharge. Again, the higher the score is 10 for both the bas fee and bas dire, the more significant the degree of um, limitation or, or disease activity, as in the case of bas dire. So the bas die again, is a six-point questionnaire, and that really pertains to um, questions about disease activities, so things like pain, stiffness, fatigue, areas of tenderness, which would take into account if there was enthesial um, sites in, involved. So his bas die on admission was 4.3. Again, the higher the score out of 10, the more um, active the disease is. It was 4.3 on admission. It was 3 on discharge. A score of four or more would indicate disease activity and you know the medics would take that into account um, if it, they needed to add in medication or just medication. Um, height and chest expansion would always be uh, looked at as well. His chest expansion was good at 6.5. Again, if you can imagine if in patients who are maybe a bit flexed over, again, Podrick is, is not that way at all, luckily. Uh, he's a good posture. Um, it would result in a restrictive lung pattern, so that would need to be looked at, but his is good, as I say, at 6.5. So the peripheral joint exam, his upper limb exam was completely normal, it, unremarkable. Um, his elbow fixed flexion deformities, as Connor mentioned previously, were all nothing to find completely normal. His hips and knees were the main issues. So on examination, he decreased glute mass bilaterally, decreased range of movement. Um, his movement was actually a lot better than had been on previous admissions back in 2014. His hip range of movement was markedly restricted at 40 degrees flexion, no internal or external rotation at all, very, very symptomatic and irritable out around the hips. At this particular time, it was 90 degrees flexion, which is, you know, it's, it's restricted, but it's, it's better than it was. Um, his um, internal rotation was 10 degrees, still restricted, but definitely better than what it had been. Power good, reasonable glute control, single leg bridge, squat, single leg stance, control not good, but endurance probably not the best. Knees, again, degree, degree squats, bulk, good flexion, but extension, again, tight, but better than it had been. Power good, again, decreased endurance. And he had no signs of enthesitis anywhere. He had been describing pre-admission what sounded like uh, an enth enthesitis at his knees, but there was no, no sign of that on admission. So overall, at that particular time, he had ongoing spinal and hip pain, but he had worked hard to maintain his spinal range of movement himself at home with his exercise, which was fantastic. The hips were still an ongoing issue with reasonable control, but decreased endurance and again, fatigue and his decreased physical activity levels. So the treatment um, involves ongoing education and advice regarding self-management. He had a daily physio and hydro uh, sessions, which would focus on sp spinal, peripheral joint flexibility, strengthening, conditioning and aerobic work. All of this, the aims of all of this is to provide ongoing support to uh, enhance his self-management skills to help with the pain and pre improve his muscle endurance, exercise tolerance, maximize his function, and all the while trying to adhere to the WHO, um, American College of Sports Medicine Physical Activity Guidelines and the ASAS Guidelines. Um, so on discharge, just to finish up, there was a little change in his hip pain. However, on the BASDI score pertaining to pain, his um, global pain had reduced by half, um, but the hips were still an issue. Uh, his bat score has improved, his exercise tolerance had gone up. So just, just a comparison over the last few years then of all his different measures there, you can see, I mean, his BASME is still, it's always been in the lower end um, of the scale. Again, remembering it's out of 10, so 1.6. And uh, you remember previously it was higher on admission, so it had improved. 
um, and it's Baz Fee again at the lower end of the scale. You can see there in 2015, 2016, his Baz die scores were, were six. There were, and remember I said f before or more would indicate disease activity. So that would have been um, when he was more symptomatic and his disease was, was more active. But as you can see, they're all coming down in the right, the right um, end of the scale here. And I'm sure if, when he's measured next again, um, they'll be even better. And uh, we would advise kind of regular review of the, the AS measures just to keep track of how he's going. Um, and I would never needed to encourage Porter to keep up with his program because he's a very determined, diligent young man. So he kind of keeps up with that himself. Um, but as I say, they're all going in the right scale and hopefully they'll continue to do so. All right. And that's it pretty much. And I'm going to hand you over now to Gillian, the social worker. Thank you. Hello, I'm the last to speak and I'll try and be as fast as I can because I know we're a little bit over. Um, my name is Gillian, I'm the social worker here in the rheumatology unit and like Sharon, there's only one of me. So um, I have a little bit of help from some of my colleagues in terms of uh, looking after the patients. But I've met with Podrick for on a couple of occasions over the, the um, couple of years that I've been here. So I said I'd just start quickly uh, with my role within the unit um, and that's to provide support to patients and their families with any psychological emotional social or practical difficulties that can arise as a result of their condition or hospital stay and i suppose that can vary greatly from you know a long-term emotional response to a chronic illness to ver the very basic practicalities of maybe the financial implications of even coming into the unit or transport so it can it can vary greatly day to day um, to work directly with patients work with their family members and liaise with community services and advocate on patients behalf and that's I suppose uh, the significant part of my role in terms of communicating with the community supports that are out there and trying to advocate on patients behalf to, to be able to access those uh, to work collaboratively with the MDT in identifying social issues that may impact on the overall care or management of the patient and I suppose I, I have great colleagues who, who are very quick to identify maybe challenges or social issues that are precluding people from being able to engage fully in the programme here. Um, to provide a safe, confidential and supportive environment to talk through any concerns, particularly focusing on adaptation to change or loss. And I suppose this is a huge piece just about um, People often say that they don't want to be a moan or they don't want to seem to be giving out or talking about their illness all the time. So therefore having a space where they can speak to a professional that's completely independent of friends and family can be very important. And then to use the biopsychosocial systems model to provide support to patients with chronic illness and their families. And I suppose the just looking at that and picking up on things that Claire and Deirdre mentioned, it's just about seeing the link between the condition itself, the symptoms that people experience, and I suppose their experience even of managing the healthcare system and um, attending hospital and what that how that influences how they're feeling in themselves. Interestingly, guilt is there, and that's something that has come up um, a number of times. Anxiety, worry, stress. Um, and then how that influences uh, our social life, our ability to maintain our roles. Um, interestingly, in Claire's presentation, she mentioned maintaining her role as a mother, a sister, a daughter. They're all things that people need to do while managing their chronic illness. So it's just recognising the links between each of those. Um, I came from the acute setting, having worked with patients with chronic illness, but I suppose there's certainly a difference working in the rheumatology unit here. And I just thought I'd identify a couple of the um, issues that tend to crop up most often. Obviously, adjusting to chronic illness and disease and the limitations of living with pain and functional disability. Um, that's, that's a huge issue. Grief and loss, and that can be the loss of independence, the loss of uh, good health, the loss of the person's role within their family um, and as Deirdre mentioned bereavement can have a significant issue because that is exacerbating a feeling of loss I suppose. Um, there's a great level of frustration about decreased level of function and I suppose just 
the obvious day-to-day -day things within a house that can be a constant reminder of the things that you're not able to do for yourself. So that, that's a very common one. Anxiety and low mood, financial issues. Um, complex family dynamics can come up at any time for any person, but I suppose when there's changes to relationships, possibly when someone's taking on a caring role or there's a change in the family um, unit, that can obviously have a significant impact. Social isolation due to disability, just the very product of not being able to leave the house for whatever reason. Um, Work-related issues, which I know a number of the presenters have talked about. Um, history of trauma of any sort that, that overwhelms someone's ability to self-manage or cope. Um, and then discharge planning, which sometimes is actually quite refreshing because that's a very practical issue that can probably be resolved quickly. Um, and I suppose then just working with Podrick over um, the years that I've been here, I first met Podrick in 2014. Um, at the time, he was 27 and he'd been living with AS for 10 years. Um, he reported to me that that was something that he was managing quite well and that it hadn't necessarily been that challenging in the sense of being able to find his own way uh, to manage that. He'd had just experienced his worst flare to date and was still experiencing joint pain and significant fatigue. Um, and while he was experiencing those symptoms, he was able to manage and sustain his role as a lab technician. But I suppose he would have spoken about the fact that the amount of energy that it took to sustain that role limited his ability to engage in social activities or meet friends. And that's something Podrick referenced himself there, just that the very product of going to work drained his energy for anything else. Despite that, he reported maintaining a positive outlook. And uh, I think when you hear him speak, you can understand that that's something that he does very well um, and tried to remain as active as possible. So very much having an, a positive outlook on his circumstances. Um, when we met again, uh, it was two years later, so at that stage he was 29, there was consistent ill health for the, the period in between, um, including that hospital admission where things, um, where the acute illness was quite significant. Um, felt it was no longer possible to sustain employment and just the energy that that was consuming just wasn't uh, sustainable, so was planning to take a year to focus on his own health. and. Um, I suppose luckily had very good support from his parents around that so that accommodation wasn't an issue but was concerned about the financial implications of being out of work. So I suppose the discussion related around what potential um, social welfare payments were the most appropriate for that time and also the importance of accessing a medical card to sustain a period of being out of work. Um, and you know I suppose as the girls mentioned project has been very proactive in managing his own circumstances so I suppose we haven't really delved into the emotional aspect of things because he's been able to maintain that positive outlook throughout um, and it sounds like things are even better now than when we last met which is great so that's really it from me